Okay? All right, here we go. Let there be praise, let there be joy in our heart. Sing to the Lord, give Him the glory, glory. Let there be praise, let there be joy in our heart. Forevermore, let His love fill the air, and let there be praise. Let there be praise, let there be joy in our heart. Sing to the Lord, give Him the glory, glory. Let there be praise, let there be joy in our hearts. Forevermore, let His love fill the air, and let there be praise. Let there be praise, let there be joy in our hearts. Sing to the Lord, give Him the glory, glory. Let there be praise, let there be joy in our hearts. Forevermore, let His love fill the air, and let there be praise. Fill the air, and let there be praise. Amen to that. Let there be praise. Hey, let's pray this morning, and we'll get into some announcements here and get back into our song service this morning, and then we'll go from there. How about that? Hey, y'all stand back up with me. We're going to sing some old hymns today. Count your blessings. When upon life's pillows you are tempted, tossed, when you are discouraged, thinking all is lost, count you many blessings, name them one by one. It will surprise you what the Lord has done. Count your blessings, name them one by one. Count your blessings, see what God has done. Count your blessings, name them one by one. Count your many blessings, see what God has done. Are you ever burdened with the load of care? Does the cross seem heavy you are called to bear? Count your many blessings, every doubt will fly. And you will be singing as the days go by. Count your blessings, name them one by one. Count your blessings, see what God had done. Count your blessings, name them one by one. Count your many blessings, see what God had done. So amid the conflict, whether great or small, do not be discouraged, God is over all. Count your many blessings, angels will attend. Help and comfort give you to your journey's end. Count your blessings, name them one by one. Count your blessings, see what God had done. Count your blessings, name them one by one. Count your many blessings, see what God has done. All right.
this other old song is called Stand Up, Stand Up for Jesus. Y'all remember that one? Old song. Stand up, stand up for Jesus, ye soldiers of the cross. Lift high His royal banner, it must not suffer long. From victory unto excitement going on here this next song is called brethren we have met to worship so the first song we all going to sing it or the first verse and the second verse guess what the men are going to do they're going to sing that one okay all right and then the third verse guess who's going to sing that the women folks that's right and then the fourth verse we all going to sing it okay can you handle that sure you can Ladies, you can do better than that. Will be. 
everybody. Let us love our God supremely. Let us love each other too. Let us love and pray for sinners till our God make all things new. You know, I got to say, I think the women folks beat. They were louder. We tried. Okay. Hey, I forgot to mention this a while ago, but Brother Bill had to go home. He was feeling kind of bad. So let's pray for Brother Bill today. And uh, But right now, Brother Chuck's coming. He's got a lot of great things to tell us that the Lord wants us to hear. So Brother Chuck, come on. Good morning. You know, I don't do that quite as well as Pastor does, being able to say good morning like that. I always enjoy it when he comes up and wakes us all up, right? Uh, I'd like to take just a a moment. Uh, I want to thank you for uh, many of you who prayed uh, for my sister, Pat. Uh, She has been going through treatments, uh, chemo treatments, uh, these past several months. And and, uh, I just want to thank you for your prayers. Uh, We have always tried to encourage her. In fact, I was told earlier that she's online watching us now. So could you indulge me this morning? Could you wave at her? I appreciate that. See, I can do that because I'm up here, right? (laughs) Oh, Turn in your Bibles, if you would, to Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians chapter 6. And the children are saying, Amen. That's what I thought I heard. Amen. I I heard uh, a story one time about a shipwrecked sailor. Now this particular sailor had spent nearly three years on a deserted island and hadn't been rescued at all. And he hadn't seen one person during all that time and he had no idea what was going on in the rest of the world. One morning he was simply uh, beside himself, you might say, when he saw a ship in the bay and a small craft was boarded by an officer and some other sailors and they were coming ashore to see him and and rescue him. And when they got to the shore, uh, there was this man that hadn't seen anybody for so long and uh, didn't know what was going on in the world. And on that boat, that officer simply took a bundle of newspapers and threw them at his feet. And he said, "Uh, this is compliments of the captain and he wants to have you just carefully read it and then let us know if you still want to be rescued. I mean, that's how bad this world is getting, right? I don't think I need to tell you this morning, because of uh, all of the communication devices we have, uh, that this world seems to be falling apart. Uh, It is unbelievable uh, what uh, goes on today, and uh, we wonder if it can get any worse, and uh, yeah, it could get worse. In fact, the Bible even says that it will get worse and worse and worse. I don't want to be the bearer of bad news this morning, but that's what the Bible says. Uh, God does give us the joy of knowing that we have Him not only as our Savior, but we have Him as our friend and the one who lives inside of us and gives us the power to live a life for Him during this day. No believer in their right mind would question that this is a a terrible day morally and spiritually. Um, I I guess I want to say this morning that I have appreciated so much of being a part of this fellowship because I really feel like this is a family of believers. And this is what gives us the strength to be able to live the Christian life, right? Uh, We know that the Lord lives in us. We know that we have His Word. We have prayer. But we also have connections with other brothers and sisters in Christ. And we have that uh, that privilege of being able to come together and and see prayers answered and and certain things happen in our lives. I'm always always, uh, aware of 1 Peter. Remember over in 1 Peter chapter 5, it says, Be sober, be vigilant, Because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about, seeking whom he may devour, whom resist steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. It is a fact that we need to face this morning, and I'd like to deal with it this morning, 
but it's a fact that we need to face is that, the, that Satan is active. Somebody said one time that God has a wonderful plan for your life. Well, the devil also has a terrible plan for your life. And he, he's more scheming and devious, and he, uh, we're no match for him. I said to somebody this morning, we're no match for him. The fact is, is that he has uh, more power than you and I have as far as uh, physical or spiritual type power, unless we rely on the Lord, because the battle is the Lord's, not ours. And uh, we just need to remind ourselves of that truth, that the world is full of corruption, it's full of trouble, it's full of temptations and trials and tests. I know you didn't come here this morning to hear all of that, because that is a pretty negative message, but at the same time, it's truth. And because that is true, God has an answer. He always has an answer. Uh, We never have to worry about the fact that God has solutions to the problems that we face. I'd like us to to just uh, bow for a moment of prayer. Could you do that with me? I want you to just uh, think a minute as we have our heads bowed and our eyes closed. I, I want more than anything else this morning for God to be seen in what is said this morning. I want myself to be set aside. And I want God to give His Word to us. He's given it to us and you have it in your Bibles, but... Uh, I don't know what you've been going through these past several months, maybe this last year or two, I don't know, maybe this last week. But you'd have to admit this morning that Satan has had a heyday in some areas. He has no desire to help you in your spiritual life. He'll not be satisfied until he drags us down into some sinful practice or lifestyle, even though society might accept it. And our question this morning is, how, 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 how can we handle that? How can we deal with that? How can we handle Satan before he mishandles our lives? The Bible tells us. Father, I pray that as we look at Your Word in Ephesians chapter 6, Lord, thank You for Your Word, and I just pray that as we look at it, that You'll give us the answers that we need to be able to live for You. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Ephesians chapter 6. I'm going to start reading, if you don't mind, in verse 10. Well, actually, if you do mind, I'm still going to read it. <laughs> I'm sorry. That's, I don't know where we get these uh, kinds of sayings. but uh, Ephesians chapter 6. Finally, my brothers, finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. Stand, therefore, having your loins girt about with truth, having on the breastplate of righteousness, and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith you shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked, and take the helmet of salvation, and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. Tremendous passage of Scripture, but I want you to notice, and I want you to just follow along with me, just go verse by verse, but in verse 10, he begins this passage by giving us the answer. In fact, if our question is, is how can I handle Satan in this day when it gets so bad, before he mishandles my life or the lives of others that I care about, how do I do that? How, do, how am I able to pull that off? Well, as we go verse by verse, he gives in the first verse that we read, in verse 10, he gives the answer. We really wouldn't need much beyond that to, to know what the answer is. But he then describes that beginning at verse 11 and going through the end of the chapter in in verse 18. And in verse 10, he simply says this, Finally, my brethren. Now, how many times have you heard a preacher say that? Finally. Twenty minutes later, he's still preaching. I mean, we have a habit of doing that. I don't know what to tell you. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. That's the answer. And as I first looked at that, it says, finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord or be strengthened by the Lord. The answer to handling Satan is to have the strength of the Lord evident in our lives. 
Now, he tells us a little bit about that when he adds, and in the, in the power of His might. You see, if God had never created the world, if God had never produced one miracle, if God had never demonstrated Himself one iota of power, He would still be omnipotent. He would be all-powerful. He would be, and that's what it's called, the might of the Lord. God is mighty whether He demonstrates that to us or not. God is mighty. And when He demonstrates that might in certain circumstances in our lives, or parts the Red Sea, or parts the Jordan River, or produces a miracle, or raising somebody from the dead as the Savior did, those are demonstrations of His might, and it's called power. So if you keep that in mind, and you look at verse 10, He says, finally, my brethren, be strengthened by the Lord, be strong in the Lord, and in the power of His might that He has within Himself. That's the answer. The battle is the Lord's. The battle is not mine. The battle isn't yours. The battle is the Lord's. And if we're facing a battle today, and we take it into our own hands, which we often do, don't we? We often do that. God says, look, you're on the wrong track. It's like the guy that came and, and knelt beside his bed one night and he's been praying about this one particular problem that he has and he deals with it and tries to deal with it again and again and again. And he's, uh, finally he just raises his hands and he says, Lord, I give up. And the Lord said, I'm glad you finally did. <laughs> now you can let the Lord work. Just If you don't remember anything else that you take from the service today, know that the battle belongs to the Lord. It doesn't belong to us. The battle is so great that nothing less than God's power can handle it. The battle is so great, Satan has so much power, there's only one way that we're going to survive and be successful spiritually. And that is, is that the Lord steps in and does His work. The battle is the Lord's. Now, he goes on to explain that. And I, I, wish, I had, wish I had two and a half hours to be able to do this, but I'm going to try to condense it a little bit. But in this passage, he says two things to describe what he just said in verse 10. He says the power of the Lord, it, it takes the power of the Lord to handle Satan. Now he's going to go on to describe it. And the first thing that he does, and let me kind of give you kind of an overview. In verses 11, 12, and 13, if you're looking at your Bibles, and it's much better to look at your Bible than to look at me, okay? Uh, it, it's, if you look in your Bible, the first verses that we're going to deal with in verses 11, 12, and 13, he says, put on God's armor. And then he offers three reasons to motivate you to do that. He says, this, this, is, this ought to motivate you and move you to do what He's asking you to do. Not only that, but when you get to verse 14 and go through verse 18, the second thing that He says is not only put on the armor, but take your stand in the armor, depending on it to do its work. Now, you'll see that more clearly as we go along, but first of all, in verses 11, 12, and 13, He says, put on God's armor. If you want to know how to handle Satan, there's only one way. You need God's armor. This armor is not passive armor in the sense that you kind of sit back and say, okay, I'm all safe and secure. Well, we are safe and secure. But the fact is, is that the protection that he describes in this armor is all active, not passive. And what I mean by that, it means that he said, when he talks about the shield of faith, he's talking about the, the shield that protects us that's called our trust in God, our faith in God. That's what the shield of faith is. God does the work, but... It takes our faith, it takes our love, it takes our living righteously, it takes all of the things that he mentions in the armor to give us protection. You see, being protected means that you don't get as, as close as you can to the edge of the cliff without falling off. You stay as far away as you can. The fact is, is that, that our protection lies in our obedience to the Lord. Our protection lies in the fact that we demonstrate righteousness in our lives. And we're going to see that in all these pieces of armor. Let's, let's back up, though, to verses 11, 12, and 13. And you might ask the question, why do I need God's armor? Why do I, I feel okay? I, I think I can handle this? Uh, in fact, you even find some preachers that get on TV and on the radio and they'll say, well, I'm going to take on Satan and I'm going to be able to take, take him by the collar and throw him aside and say, you can't control me. You're no match. I'm no match for, for Satan. There's only one person that is a match for Satan, and that's God Almighty. He is the only one. So what he says in verses 11, 12, and 13, if you're asking the question why, there are three reasons. I want you to jot them down. Three reasons why you ought to put on God's armor. Number one, verse 11, and we read this. Put on the whole armor of God 
that, or maybe literally in order that, you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. The word wiles, we don't use that a lot, a lot of times in our language, but the word wile, wiles is a word that uh, sounds like method. It's methodes, and it need, it's talking about the methods of the devil. And what he's simply saying is that, that if you put on God's armor, you're going to be able to handle Satan by, because you're going to be standing against the wiles of the devil, the methods of the devil. That's a reason why you ought to put on the armor. His methods far outdo your methods. His wiles, his schemes far outdo what you're able to do. You're no match. If I can get one thing across in the first half of this passage, and that is, is that, that I am no match. You are no match in terms of method or practice or anything that you do. You are no match in and of yourself against the devil. There's only one that is, and that's God. So he says, I want to motivate you. And say, In fact, he's simply saying here that Satan has an organized plan of attack. He has a way of doing things. He has a method. He's intelligent. He's deceptive. He uses that method to defeat us for his own gain. And you could go on and on and on. He does all of that. And so, if, if I put on the armor, at that point, I'm going to be able to handle Satan's methods. Because God's going to give me his wisdom. Right? That's the only thing that protects us. If you think that you've got everything under control and you could, it could never happen to you what happened to somebody else, guess again. We are sinners saved by grace. Grace, grace alone. Secondly, in verse 12, he says there's another reason, another thing that would happen if you put on God's armor. And he says, not only put on the whole armor of God, but he says in verse 12, for or because, he's given a reason, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, powers, rulers of the darkness of this world, spiritual wickedness in high places. This is not a human battle. It's a spiritual battle. If we're going to not only survive, but if we're going to be successful and effective spiritually, we're going to have to be able to handle Satan's method, but not, not only that, but his army. That's what he's talking about. I don't, I don't know what all of this entails when he says principalities and powers, rulers of the darkness of the sea. I don't know what all that entails, but it looks like an organized army to me. He has demons at his disposal. He, there are demonic forces uh, if you read in Daniel, and we're going to study Daniel in our Bible Institute beginning in July, and uh, one of the things that you'll discover there is that, that Satan and his minions, his, his, demonic, uh, uh, his demonic army, does his bidding and, and, and even hinders prayer at times. All kinds of things are done. And, and, and I don't think that we ought to spend all of our time thinking about Satan and thinking about uh, spending all your time studying about him. And the, but once in a while we need to step back a, a, for a moment and we need to look at Scripture and say, what does the Bible say? And Paul certainly, when he began the book of Ephesians, and I think the pastor just began the book of Ephesians in chapter 1, but the first three chapters are dealing with doctrine and position. He's simply communicating to us that we are in Christ. We are in Christ and we are protected and secure in Him. And, and the first three chapters talk about that great salvation that He's given, giving, that, giving us that acceptance. And then He moves to chapter 4, and when you go to chapter 4, there's, there's always a therefore or some word like that that lets you know He's beginning now a practical section. And as He winds up talking about all the different pra practical things we ought to do, He ends up with this passage you and I are looking at. You might say that Paul is saying, oh, one last thing. <laughs> and he says, there's something very important you need to know. That if God has given you that great salvation and you're going to live that in your Christian life, there's only one way you're going to do it. And that's to depend on the Lord. There's no other way. I didn't think uh, uh, this last couple of months with uh, Linda's mother passing away and going to be with the Lord and and then my best friend, my spiritual father, my pastor of 45 years uh, passed away suddenly the next month. And uh, when I was sitting in the congregation waiting, I was supposed to do the message for the funeral. And I sat there and as I, as I waited, we sang some songs that were familiar, familiar songs. And I didn't know. I, I told the Lord, I said, Lord, I don't know if I can do this. But you know, I knew that a lot of people were praying for us. And when, when I paused and just thought about that for a moment, it just seemed like a peace came over me. 
And when I get up to preach, I, I can't tell you that it's hard to explain an experience like that. That God gave us the peace and the, the ability to be able to preach and the freedom to be able to preach God's Word. And I know that there's only one reason, and that's because the might of the Lord stepped in. We can't live this life, no matter what it is, no matter what we face. There's only one way we can handle it, and that's by the might of the Lord, by the power of the Lord. Put on God's armor. Why? Well, we're going to be able to handle Satan's methods if we do. Secondly, we'll be able to handle Satan's army if we do. The word wrestle was an interesting, it's a word that was often used about the wrestling matches they would have uh, in uh, the, the ancient world. And when it talks about it, I mean, th these are pretty serious matches. It, it wasn't that uh, you'd have a wrestling match and, and then you'd shake hands afterwards and go your way. I mean, usually the loser had his eyes gouged out. I mean, this was serious business. And he uses that to talk about the rest, that we wrestle not with flesh and blood, but we, we wrestle against spiritual things in high places in the darkness of this world. Uh, it is a spiritual battle. It is a powerful battle that Satan tries to exhibit. And God steps in oftentimes when we trust Him and handles the battle. Why? The battle is the Lord's. That's why. The battle belongs to Him. We'll be able to handle Satan's methods. We'll be able to handle Satan's army. And then last, we'll be able to handle Satan's attacks. Now, I want to be very careful as I go through this because I want you to look at it again in verse 13. Wherefore, or therefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, here's another reason, that you may be able to withstand, and in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. Now, let's just think about what's going on here. He's not talking about the overall prophetic, uh, they call it an eschatological evil day in the future, that somehow God's going to wrap it up in the battle of Armageddon. That is, that is true. But what he's talking about in this passage is not that future day of battle, but he's talking about the battles we face day in and day out. He's talking about the skirmishes, the attacks, the personal attacks that take place. And he says, take unto you the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand that attack in the evil day. And then notice what he adds, and having done all to stand. It doesn't quite capture maybe exactly the way I wanted to, wanted to say it, but it does say this. He says in the last part of the verse, and having done completely all that we can ever do to still be standing at the end of the battle. Isn't that great? I mean, the fact is, is that we, we may come out with bruises. We may come out with some broken bones, spiritually speaking. We may come away from that fight bruised and beaten. But we're still standing. And that's what the Lord gives, because the Lord is taking care of the battle. When those skirmishes take place and and the devil tries to inflict us and tries to destroy us and tries to do whatever he can to destroy our testimony, then that's when God can step in as we depend on the armor. But what he does in these opening verses in 11, 12, and 13 is to give us a motive, get, motivate us to, to put on that armor. And then after putting it on, what do we do? We stand in it. And that's what he says in the last half. Someone once said that just because we do not sense an attack does not mean that there isn't one. We may not sense that we're being attacked, but every time you're tempted, every time that you face discouragement, every time you're down in the valley, every time you face something that, that you don't want to face in making a decision, every time you face something difficult and, and from your perspective it's not something you want to experience, every time that happens, Satan may not be personally present, but his demonic hosts are fanning the flames. They're trying to do anything that they can do to get you led astray. And maybe even led astray in perfectly good things. I mean, there are a lot of things that we enjoy, to do, enjoy doing. And, and I can say that I, I enjoy, don't tell anybody this, okay? But I enjoy a game or two of, of the Dallas Cowboys. I, I heard a groan. Well, I, I groan right along with you. I became a fan back in the 70s. In fact, my wife lived in Dallas and, and uh, when we would go to church and then we'd come home after church, not home, but back to her mother's house, uh, I had to watch the football. And I never watched football before that. But my wife was a fan of the Dallas Cowboys and so if I wanted to date her on Sunday afternoon, we were going to watch the Cowboys. Mark it down. I enjoy watching a game. I enjoy certain things like that. But you know what? 
even good things can become sinful. Yep. If it, if it takes away, if it does anything to steer you away from the Lord, it's not right. Now, if I, if I decided, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to spend all my time watching football and playing golf and doing whatever I want to do, and, and I'm not going to pay any attention to the Lord's house and the Lord's Word. And if I do that, you know what's going to happen to me, right? As a believer, I'm going to be disciplined. It's not right. The fact is, is that when those skirmishes take place, when innocent things are decided about what we think, and innocent flirtation, you might say, uh, when those things happen, those are Satan's invitations. Those are his inflictions. Those, that's what he's trying. He's trying to fan the flames of what's going on in your life so that a brush fire will start and, and your life could be destroyed. All you have to do is talk to families today, and some of you have voiced concerns about your family and your children, and, and you know what the devil can do. The devil can lead a lot of people astray and, and do the kinds of things that, that bring a heartache to the parents and a heartache to the people that care about them. But the battle is the Lord's. The battle is the Lord's. If we're going to handle that kind of situation, we're going to have to depend on the Lord and not ourselves. So he says, put on God's armor. And then the last half of the passage, and I'm going to go through this rather quickly this morning, but I, I want you to get the gist of what he's talking about. Because every piece of armor that we look at in this list, in this passage of Scripture, is what I call active. It's something you have to do. So armor, you, you'd normally think, of, and I was going to give you a picture of that armor, and I did, wasn't able to do that, but uh, when you look at the Roman armor that was put on in terms of battle, every piece meant something. Every piece had a function. Uh, the main thing was the, the big belt that they wore around their waist that everything else was attached to, including the sword. And, and when you talk about those pieces, those pieces you think of like being passive, you know, you're going to put yourself behind a bulletproof vest or something, you know, and that's your protection. But what he does is he uses that picture that Ro Paul knew so well, that picture of a Roman soldier, and he uses it to talk about spiritual armor. And the spiritual armor is not passive, that you can kind of stand back and let the bullets glance off you, the darts, the flaming arrows, he talks about them. But what we can do is we can do certain things that will protect our lives. And so he says in this passage of Scripture, beginning at verse 14, stand therefore, that's where I get the sense, stand in the armor. He has already talked about putting the armor on, now stand in the armor. Having, your, having girded your loins with truth, you might say. Otherwise, he's talking about all of this armor being put on in the past. And now he says, stand therefore. Otherwise, you can, you can do the things that are listed in the armor, but you've got to trust it. You've got to trust that if you're a truth teller, that that's going to protect you. You've got to trust that when you exhibit trust in God, that that's going to protect you. You're going to have to trust the fact that the salvation, the helmet of salvation that he gives, you're going to have to trust the fact that your salvation gives you an element of protection. You're going to have to say that... Uh, your, your feet are shod with the sandals. And he t talks about peace being characteristic of that. You're going to have to trust that that element protects you. Now let's look at it. Let me just say a word about each one. And then I'm going, to, I'm going to ask you to make a decision this morning. He says, first of all, having uh, your waist girded, your loins girded with truth. Being truthful. Being a truth teller. You know the problem with lying, other than the fact that it's a sin... But the trouble with lying is that when you talk to somebody else, you've got to make sure you keep your story straight. Yeah. Now, what did I tell Joe? Well, what did I tell her? I mean, if you tell the truth, you don't have to worry, right? There's an element of protection when you tell the truth. And so he talks about that in verse 14. In verse 14, he talks about the breastplate of righteousness. And there he's not talking about the fact that when you, when you trust Christ as your Savior... The Bible says that you're placed into Christ, and when God looks down on you, He does not see your sin. In fact, He, see, he sees the righteousness of Christ. Now, that is called positional righteousness. He's given that, us that righteousness. He's not talking about that here. He's talking about a practical righteousness. He says the protection you have is the fact that you're living righteously. It tends to protect you. Now, you may make a stupid mistake like I've done in the past or others have done and, and, and you, you step out and you don't live righteously and all of a sudden you've got a problem. Well, I mean, that's possible, but the fact is, is that 
when you, when you do the right thing, when you do righteously, when you live righteously, it has a tendency, it has a focus on protecting you when you do. And so he says, the breastplate of righteousness. And then notice what he says in verse 15. He says, in your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Your feet uh, shod with the preparation which comes from the gospel of peace is the sense of it. Otherwise, the, there's a preparation when, when the gospel, when, when you understand that Jesus Christ died for you on the cross and He arose from the dead and that eternal life is a free gift based on faith alone and Christ alone without works, without baptism, without going to church to, to try to get it. You can't earn it by doing that. We, do, we come to church and we do what we do because we want to grow and we want to become more effective. Here, he's talking about the fact that our, our protection comes from our feet being shod with a preparation which comes from the gospel which is characterized by peace. When you have peace, that all is well. Then that protects you. If, you. if you go around worrying all the time and you're in anxiety all the time about the circumstances of life, it's going to destroy you spiritually. It's going to destroy you physically eventually. I mean, there are all kinds of protections that come in when we practice the, the elements that he gives in this passage on the armor of God. And then he talks about the shield of faith. The shield is a, 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 was about four feet by two feet, but aside from the, that, it was the largest one of the two, two shields that they had. And he says that your shield, your shield is faith. It depends upon you not trusting yourself, but you trusting God. And that's protection. If you trust in yourself, you're going to lose. If you trust in God, you can only win by trusting God. And then he talks about the helmet of salvation. Because, and maybe he uses the helmet on the head because uh, we, we think and we reason together and we know that uh, if we do certain things, certain things will happen. Well, the helmet of salvation... I mean, there's a sense of confidence. There's a sense of, I don't have to worry about my salvation, uh, losing my salvation, and, and, and somehow disobeying in a certain area, and I don't have that eternal life any longer. Salvation is a forever thing, right? We are forever saved. We're forever given eternal life. Now, God is massively interested and encourages, and even disciplines those who don't. He is massively encouraging you as a believer to live a righteous life. It's your way of saying, Lord, thank you for the eternal life that you've given. Thank you for saving my soul. Thank you for changing my life. And because of that, I want to live for you even more effectively in the days ahead. I mean, that's what our heart ought to be, right? If, if our heart is not that, if we just simply come in and, and mentally assent to the fact that Jesus died, Jesus arose, and I'm happy, I'm saved, I'm going to go live my life the way I want to live it. It doesn't work that way. This is a different kind of thing altogether in the Bible. When you talk about salvation, eternal life, these are huge issues in the Bible. All of the Old Testament is given over to paving the way to us to understand the coming of the Savior and the coming of the Messiah. And it talks about the salvation that's going to be provided by that Messiah and all that's going to happen in its wake. And, and then you come to the New Testament and Jesus dies on the cross. And in those moments and those hours on the cross, he suffered every conceivable pain and horrible experience that you can imagine. And he was doing it because of you and you and you and me. He died on the cross and in those few hours on the cross, he did everything necessary on the cross to pay your penalty of eternal death and eternal judgment. He paid for that sin completely. One of the last things he said on the cross, tetelestai in Greek. It means it is finished. It's completed. Everything that needed to be done is done. One time a young man came up to me in a Christian serviceman center where we were witnessing to the military. And we were talking about this salvation. And uh, he says, well, and, I, and, I, and I, had, I had heard him talking and it sounded like he was a little bit cynical of some of the things we were saying in the Bible. And, and, uh, he, and he said, well, how can I be, what do I need to do to be saved? And I wanted to shock him a little bit, so I said, you're too late. It's already done. Jesus did it all. Jesus paid it all. All to Him I owe. I mean, my sins have been paid for. I have eternal life, not because of who I am or what I've done, but of who He is and what He's done in my place. He did it all. He died for me. 
I'll never get over the fact that when Pastor Erickson, my good friend, uh, took a bunch of us Navy guys over to a church uh, off of Tangier Island, and I, I was supposed to be a part of preaching, but he preached that day, and, and uh, when we got there, he sat on the platform. It was a pretty large uh, Baptist church, and uh, as, as he sat there and he waited to, to preach, they, the choir got up and sang the song, When I Survey the Wondrous Cross. When I survey the wondrous cross, there the Prince of Glory died. And you know the words to that song. It gets near the end and it says, Were the whole realm of nature mine, that were a present far too small. I mean, the only thing that I can say in response to what Jesus did is, I don't deserve it. I deserve hell. I deserve judgment. I, I deserve eternal suffering. That's what I deserve. But Jesus paid it all. He paid the price. He did everything necessary. And all you can do is respond to that in faith. That's the only thing we can do. And if you have that kind of confidence in your mind that you're saved, that's the helmet of salvation. And then he talks about the sword of the Spirit, the last piece of armor, one of the last pieces of armor. The sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. It's not a protection to you to hold up your Bible like they do in the movies, you know. They, they hold the Bible up to try to protect them. Leather and paper is not going to protect you. What he's talking about here is he uses a, a word in the a couple of different words in the New Testament. One has a re reference to the written word of God. The other word that's used here is talking about preaching and, and communicating. So he says the, the word that you've memorized and you stored in your memory banks, you might say, that word that you use when 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 it says in First Corinthians uh, chapter what is it, chapter ten, verse uh, thirteen. There hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able, but will with the temptation also make a way to escape. I mean, when Jesus dealt with the devil and his temptations, what did he do in the wilderness? He quoted Scripture, right? That's the proclaimed word. And that's the word he uses here. So your protection, when it talks about the sword of the Spirit, is the word of God, is that word that you've got stored in your life and in your mind and heart, and you use in those times of skirmishes, in those times of battle, knowing that you can't handle it. If Jesus decided that He was going to let God handle it and quoted Scripture, you and I need the same thing. We need to trust God. It is His battle. He's going to take care of the situation and the circumstances. And then one that is not normally used in this passage of Scripture, and, and any military guy would know exactly what I'm talking about. Right near the end, he says in verse 18, Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. You see, part of the armor, part of the characteristic of the, of the soldier was that you had somebody that took care of you on the right, somebody that took care of you on the right, left, and then he took care of you two guys. I mean, you had, you had an interrelationship with one another. You don't fight a battle alone. You have brothers and sisters in Christ. And what he's saying here is that prayer for one another, that's another piece of armor. If you want to protect your life, you're going to have to depend upon Him and not upon yourself. And part of that is the praying saints all over this auditorium. I mean, this, this is such a fantastic passage of Scripture. I can't tell you how, how important it is, but I do know one thing. That those believers, as one, some, somebody once said, those believers that have a Bible that is falling apart, usually they're not falling apart. I mean, we need the Word of God so desperately in our day. I can't tell you how important it is. I grew up and I was 19 years of age before I was saved. I was saved in Indianapolis, Indiana. And a young Christian girl, and I didn't even know that she was a Christian, but she gave me a gospel tract. And I read that tract. And it told me how to be saved. It gave the gospel plan of salvation. And I prayed in that third floor apartment building. I was all by myself. I didn't know what to do afterwards. And and so I went to the library to find something to read about the Bible. I didn't know what to do. I didn't even have a Bible. You know, and, uh, and I, I got a record, I think it was a message by somebody on the record, and trying to, trying to grow spiritually. But I know from experience that we desperately, desperately need the Word of God in our lives if we're going to have protection. If you're not spending time in your, your Bible, this love letter from God to you, you're missing out. You desperately, I desperately need that in my life. I've got cards that I'm, I'm 
I, I used to do it for years, and I started doing it more because I, whenever I would study a passage of Scripture, I would, I would have memory verses in that passage. But I, I'm starting to go over some of those old verses again on a little, little card. I can't tell you how much, how much encouragement comes from that. If you're not getting into the Word, if you're just trying to depend on your own ingenuity and your own reasoning, your own intelligence, it's not going to fly. It may for a while, but you're going to stub your toe along the way and you might even destroy your life in the process. And so I encourage you this morning, believer, if you're going to handle Satan before he mishandles you, there's only one way to do it. That's to depend upon him and his armor. That's to have this true in your life so that you'll be protected. Now, I want you to bow in prayer with me, would you? As we draw our service to a close, I know I've said a lot of things this morning, a lot to, a lot to digest, but I, I keep going back to the beginning of that passage of Scripture where it says, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. I encourage you this morning, if, if, if that is missing in your life, if these pieces of armor about truth-telling righteous living, salvation. If this is not true in your life, may it become true this morning. You may be here and, and you've never come to the uh, realization, maybe you just don't know for sure that if you should die right where you're sitting, if your heart would stop beating, you know where you'd spend eternity. If you don't know and you'd like to know, the Bible tells us that we're all sinners. It tells us that sinners spend eternity in judgment and hell. But that Jesus died for us and arose from the dead. And that if we would genuinely, repentantly, place our trust in Jesus Christ alone, God will give us eternal life as a free gift. And our lives will begin to change to demonstrate that. I want to encourage you, if you, if you don't know for certain, and you'd like to know and you'd like to, you'd like to make that decision this morning, of having your faith in Christ, would you just slip your hand up and down? Just slip your hand up and down and very quickly, no one looking around. Amen. Anyone else? I just want to know for certain that I have eternal life. If maybe you're here this morning and you're saved, but you're losing the battle and you desperately want the believers to pray for you, and you want to have victory, and you want to have an impact, would you slip your hand up and down? All over. All over. Father, I just pray this morning for my brothers and my sisters in Christ. These have not been easy days in the lives of many people that are sitting here today. And yet, Lord, we know who wins the battle. We know that it's not us that fights the battle. I just pray that we'll continue to have our trust in you and not in ourselves. If you've made spiritual decisions this morning, if you'd like to let me know or one of our leaders know, I would appreciate it. And we'll try to get some answers to you. Let's stand together. Tony, let's sing a song to close the service. I guess he's not here. I'm going to leave, okay? And I, I, I don't even know, Jan, if you know, you probably, thank you, Lord, for saving my soul. If not, we just... Thank you, Lord, for saving my soul. Thank you, Lord, for making me whole. Thank you, Lord, for giving to me great salvation so rich and free uh, one of the guys BJ would you like to pray for us this morning